There are several movies out there that just feels like the 80s personified, and My Science Project is one of those films that takes you back to one of the most radical decades ever. Released in 1985, My Science Project follows teenage character Michael Harlan, who is on the verge of failing science class by his science teacher played by an enthusiastic Dennis Hopper, where he enters an abandoned US airbase in order to try and find something cool to use for his science project, where Harlan finds a powerful alien device called Gizmo which displays great power and light, and it becomes apparent that the device meddles with time, and opens up time portals from across the ages, where Harlan and his friends must put a stop to the device's power, before the whole world is destroyed because of it. So, let me get this right. Harlan storms a high-tech base of alien secrets and technology. Damn, Harlan was doing the Area 51 meme before it was a thing. So with that, we are going to explore this often forgotten but always pleasing gem by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about my science project. Let's check it out. Number 10, the movie was going to start with alien puppets. My Science Project starts in 1957 with a UFO crash landing to Earth, where the US government finds the aircraft and secures it. All while the viewer sees <gasps> nothing. Yep. The action takes place and we the viewer just see stars. Uh, woohoo. Yeah, this may have been a boring start and like you're missing out on the action, however the movie was going to start by seeing the alien creatures who operate the craft, and alien puppets were actually made only to be scrapped in favour of just seeing empty space instead. I guess the logic is, if your puppets look a little bit rubbish, then just show nothing. <laughs> love it. Number 9, Filming Locations. My Science Project was written and directed by American writer-director Jonathan R. Betwell, who had previously written The Last Starfighter, and I can see similarities between the two movies, as they both follow a young teenager living in a mundane life going on a fantastical science fiction adventure. Even if The Last Starfighter feels whimsical and My Science Project feels more like a spoof. The movie was filmed around California, particularly around Glendale and Los Angeles, during the 1980s, a lot of fantasy movies were based around suburban California, a trait made popular thanks to Spielberg movies such as E.T. and Poltergeist. Number 8. Rick Baker worked on the movie as a consultant. My Science Project had a very small budget compared to other fantasy movies that came out at that time, but despite this, the special effects of My Science Project do actually look pretty good and in no way looks cheap or makes you think low budget. The movie's true money shot is a scene where a T-Rex starts walking around the place. Now, it's no Jurassic Park, but once again, it's still a fairly impressive effect given the movie's budget and time that it was made in. What also may help is the fact that special effects legend Rick Baker worked on the movie as, quote, a consultant. Baker had made a name for himself in the industry, providing special effects makeup for Star Wars and an American werewolf in London. And let's face it, having Rick Baker work on your movie can only make it a better movie, even if it is just as a consultant. Number 7, The Music of My Science Project The funky, hip 80s music of My Science Project was conducted by musician Peter Bernstein, who incidentally is the son of composing legend Elmer Bernstein, who scored classic movies such as To Kill a Mockingbird, Magnificent Seven, Animal House and Ghostbusters. For his My Science Project score, Peter Bernstein keeps the energy of the movie going with his fun, energetic music. Bernstein has composed other movies that sadly didn't go down as well in the sands of time as My Science Project, such as those two Ewok movies and Wild Wild West, which he co-scored with his father Elmer. He did, however, also compose music for TV shows such as 21 Jump Street, The New Outer Limits and Stargate SG-1. 
And I think it's a shame that he never got to fully spread his wings further in terms of scoring more classical movies. But regardless, his scores are still great. Number 6. Box Office Woes Although My Science Project has gone on to become a cult classic, appreciated more and more with the passing of time, when it first came out it was a box office dud, opening up at the 14th spot in the box office, and only making just over $4 million. And the movie would only be shown in cinemas for two weeks. It's one of those movies that sort of came and went and no one really noticed at the time. However, when My Science Project was released on home video is when its popularity did finally start to pick up. A common thing that happened to so many other similar movies of that time, such as Flight of the Navigator. But despite its not so flattering box office performance, My Science Project is no joke one of the most requested movies I have ever had to make an episode on, as over the last two years I have had tons and tons of requests for it. Number 5, one of the first Touchstone Pictures. My Science Project was a Disney production, made by its Touchstone department, which was a brand new division of Disney in 1985, with My Science Project being one of the first movies to be released by Touchstone. The fourth to be exact, with the first being Splash, followed by Country, and Baby Secret of Lost Legend. The irony is, is that at that time Disney was offered to produce Back to the Future, but turned the project down because they thought the mum having a crush on her son's subplot would be too perverted. It almost makes me wonder if My Science Project was Disney's answer to Back to the Future. I mean, once they got wind that Universal Pictures and Steven Spielberg were working on that movie. So henceforth, Disney made its own teenage movie about time travel. As for Touchstone, the company would go on to make many classic movies such as Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Dick Tracy, Con Air, Face Off and many, many more, and is still going strong to this day. In fact, Touchstone's most financially successful movie to date is Armageddon! Um, yeah. Number 4, My Science Poster. The poster for My Science Project seems pretty basic enough as we see our main cast of 20-something year old teenagers holding the gizmo surrounded by mysterious mist. I can distinctively remember seeing this poster on a VHS cover at a video store when I was a kid and just being drawn to how mysterious and powerful it looks. The original poster has We Must Destroy the World written over and over again, suggesting it's an alien invasion movie where it's more of a story about the meddling of time. What's interesting is the original poster shows the Vince character with a machine gun and cigar, along with Sherman who also has a gun. But in modern day Blu-ray packaging, the guns and cigar have been removed. As if George Lucas came to town and decided he didn't want the characters to look like cold-blooded killers. I also find the European poster to be fascinating, which by the way seems to be called Adventures in the Fourth Dimension. This poster looks more animated, but damn, I actually really like it and think it looks more exciting and enticing than the original US poster. So I think it's a shame that this poster wasn't chosen for the US release, even if Harlan does look a bit like Michael Keaton. No, seriously, he does, right? Number three, the Swedish hybrid release. Uh, it's a hybrid. In Sweden, it was decided to release the movie as a mix of Ghostbusters and Back to the Future, and rename My Science Project as Time Busters. Yep, if there's something weird in the neighborhood, like dinosaurs, call Harlan and his friends. Ghostbusters and Back to the Future were some of the biggest movies of 1984 and 1985, so I guess that's why that marketing strategy was chosen. But damn, if there ever was a movie that sees a crossing of Back to the Future and Ghostbusters, then that'll be awesome. But in the meantime, the closest we have to that is My Science Project and its Time Busters Swedish release. Number 2, Pop Cultural References My Science Project is a movie full of pop cultural references. Yep, long before Marvel thought it was cool, My Science Project was already addressing other movies and TV shows. For a start, the Fisher character talks about a movie involving a haunted car that kills people. This is a reference to Christine, the John Carpenter movie based on a book by Stephen King which also starred My Science Project star John Stockwell. 
When the teacher Bob Roberts returns from the 60s, Dennis Hopper is wearing the same costume he wore when he played Billy in Easy Rider, complete with Tash a movie Hopper actually starred in in 1969. And I like to think that it's the exact same costume that Hopper wore and just had it laying around and got it out again for filming this film. Speaking of costumes, My Science Project also sees characters wearing a Darth Vader and Stormtrooper helmets, cause you know, Star Wars. It's also been suggested that the alien device, the gizmo, got its name from the Mogwai gizmo from Gremlins, which came out one year earlier. There are other things mentioned in the dialogue here and there, like the Outer Limits TV show, and Harlan states that he likes Bruce Springsteen, but has never seen Return of the Jedi. Damn, Harlan, what's going on? You sure need to catch up, mate. Think of all those Ewoks you're missing out on. Yeah, when the script was written, it would have been 1984, and at the time, Return of the Jedi would have been the big thing. Well, not to Harlan it wasn't. He is such a rebellious teen, he has got no time for all that Jedi stuff. Number one, it came out in a trend of teenage science fiction comedies. One of the reasons why My Science Project didn't do too well in the box office may be down to the fact that it came out during a rampage of teen science fiction comedies, including Weird Science, Real Genius, oh, and a little movie that you may have heard about called Back to the Future. My Science Project's poster may have boldly declared that this is the funniest sci-fi movie of the summer, but that clearly wasn't the case, as My Science Project didn't perform as well as those other movies, and got completely overshadowed by them, especially Weird Science and Back to the Future. So maybe My Science Project's biggest downfall is oversaturation in the genre. Maybe it would have performed better and would have been more remembered if it wasn't released alongside those other movies. Well, we may never know. But if I hit the cinemas in 1985, I wouldn't have mind seeing My Science Project as a double bill with Back to the Future. My Science Project is a fun, adventurous 1980s movie. And what's not to love about fun, adventurous 1980s movies? A carefree time when it was just about the spectacle and enjoyment of it all. And if you haven't seen My Science Project and you're a fan of 80s movies, then do check it out. Anyway, I'm Minty, and what's with this scene where those guys are walking around with Stormtrooper helmets? Seriously, who does that? See yous. Hey guys, today I'm talking about a picture book that was published in 1986 called The Mirror Stone. A fantasy book that has a really nifty gimmick in that the book actually uses some pretty cool holograms. But actually to be fair though, it isn't really a gimmick, as having these holograms in the story actually makes sense, as the story is about magic mirrors and reflections that show you other worlds and alternative ways of viewing things, even oneself. And in some instances, these mirrors actually act as portals to other dimensions. The Mirror Stone tells the story of Paul, who is a pre-teen growing up in 1980s England, when he starts noticing his reflection isn't quite right, like it's him in the mirror but a slightly different version, where he is then pulled into a sort of fantasy medieval world by this strange and creepy wizard who is hundreds of years old, who is called Salaman, who tells Paul that he has been watching him through the mirrors and reflections, and the reason why Paul's reflection looks different is because he is seeing a much stronger alternative version of himself, what he wants to see, hence his reflection hasn't been quite right. Salomon tells Paul that because he is a good swimmer at school, he needs to send him to a lost underwater kingdom to retrieve the Mirror Stone, because I guess Ian Thorpe was unavailable. The Mirror Stone is a powerful lost mirror that Salomon had created years ago, but lost, and now Paul is sent against his will to swim to the kingdom and find the Mirror Stone. The book actually really scared me as a kid, as it has a haunting atmosphere and a sense of our main hero, Paul, a young boy being in danger, which always made me feel a bit uneasy. Although I did like the idea of puddles and mirrors taking you to alternative worlds. Right, so here's some fun facts about the book. The book is actually co-written by Michael Palin of Monty Python fame. Also, the very year that this book was published, fellow Python Terry Jones co-wrote the movie Labyrinth. And the two stories are kind of similar, as Mirrorstone has that dark fantasy feel. The same as movies such as Labyrinth and The Princess Bride. Palin also co-wrote Time Bandits, and once again it's very similar, 
as we see a boy get transported into an otherworldly adventure, all while just being in his own home. When Paul is sent to the other world, it is explained that he is wearing a Ghostbusters t-shirt. Obviously, we can't see the front of it though for copyright issues, and it is further explained that the t-shirt is thrown into Solomon's fireplace. Seriously, who does that? Who does Solomon think he is? Walter Peck? Solomon is really creepy. And it's kind of daunting having this creepy old man know this every kid's move by observing him through reflections. And he also seems to like ranting about what a genius he is. And he is really obsessed with getting the mirror stone. He's not particularly a bad guy. He's just not a good guy either. Also, is it just me or does he look a little bit like Riff Raff from the Rocky Horror Picture Show? I keep expecting him to start singing Let's Do the Time Warp again. Then there is the sea monster. This beast scared the hell out of me as a kid, as we literally see Paul have to swim for dear life to escape this thing. The book has themes of growing up and embracing the person you're going to become, and it's about being brave and facing your fears, which is why Solomon is selfish. He has denied the ages that he has lived and personal growth, in favour of his pursuits of power and intelligence. Whereas by the end of the book, Paul can embrace his new reflections thanks to his courage and bravery, and thus become the person he's going to be. It's a great book to have for anyone of any age who is interested in going on an outer-worldly adventure. Anyway, until next time, see ya!